right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Tamsin Webster, who is in Boston, Massachusetts. How are you doing, Tamsin? I'm very well. Thanks. Hopefully not too snowy, cold or... Whatever. You know, it has been, uh, but today it is much warmer. So I'm not going to attempt the Celsius conversion, but uh, it is. Oh. It, I, <laughs> I, 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 I tell you, honestly, I left I left Ireland uh, 25 years ago around the time of the switch over from we used to have everything dual for a while, like you'd have miles and kilometers and all. That oh, yeah, yeah. So to be honest, I don't really understand it either because I came over here and just <laughs> continued continued with the old system. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's about it's mid forties here, and so it's 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 been below freezing for much. It was below freezing for much of January, so it's lovely for it to be warmer. Good, good, so, good, good. So I won't yeah. tell you it's in I won't tell you it's in the eighties here today, but that's uh, oh, is it point. nice? <laughs> <laughs> that's so, fine. Yeah. So Tamsin is part keynote speaker, part message strategist all about building ideas, 20 years in marketing, 13 years as Weight Watchers leader, and four years as TEDx executive producer. Uh, and you've turned it into a simple way to change how people see and what they do as a result. And it's called the red thread. So we're gonna talk about finding your red thread. So uh, so let's get straight into it, Tamsin. First of all, let me ask you a really obvious question. What's a red thread? A red thread is the simplest way is to say it's the story that we tell ourselves uh, to make things make sense. So there's always a when there's always a cause and effect. We see something happen and we you know we come up with an explanation for why things happen that way. Um, that's how I see the red thread is the connection our brain makes to make those two things make sense with each other. Uh, excellent. And then what are, what are some of the I mean, what are some of the ways that we think and how do we how do people put these together? Because you said it's a story we tell ourselves. So what do we draw on when we're putting the thread together? Yeah. So it's in, in order to figure that out, you can uh, we can draw from classical storytelling because there's a reason why a you know, traditional once upon a time stories have the elements they do because those are the elements that our brain needs in order to explain, justify, you know, fully understand the transformation that all stories are about. So I look at it and when I was doing all the research on stories and there's tons of stuff out there, uh, a lot of it made sense to me, but it wasn't practical. It was hard for me to figure out, well, how do I use it in sales messaging or marketing messaging? I, I get how I'm supposed to like tell a story, let's say about a successful client, but how do I get the benefit of all that power of story, even if I'm not telling a story? So I boiled all stories down to five elements. And these are the ones that are both in classical storytelling and in these red thread stories that we tell ourselves. Um, the first is what somebody wants, a goal. Uh, the second is some problem that they didn't know about that gets in the way. So the discovery of a problem that they didn't realize was behind the thing, like them not getting the thing that they want, that they have mm -hmm. to solve. Um, a moment of truth where that problem becomes impossible to ignore and the main character or our audiences, cl clients and customers have to make a choice. There's a point of no return is the way a lot of stories refer to them. Uh, and then a change, you know, what choice that is actually made. Uh, and then the actions that bring that choice about, uh, and those five elements, goal, problem, truth, change, action, are those elements that we need when we're trying to explain, persuade, and help people find our ideas irresistible. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating what you uh, outlined there and what you mentioned about storytelling, because, I mean, most of us come from cultures with a very oral uh, storytelling tradition. Like, I mean, as as we mentioned before, just coming on air or here, like I'm originally from from Ireland. Now, Ireland has a very rich oral history, and you know, storytellers would go from village to village, and poets and musicians, all highly regarded, highly regarded by by nobility and everything. And I think it really, and I think most uh, most cultures have that oral uh, mm. and that storytelling. Um, uh, culture. So we're, we're kind of hardwired for it in some ways. Very in every way. I mean, there's a, there is a ton of research about this. 
uh, not only why and how we respond so well to stories, to those kind of oral traditions and mm -hmm. legends and myths and all of that, but how our brain, even before we consciously think, is trying to find things like characters and events and motivations and and cause and effect and you know the thought that we think we have has already been processed through the part of our brain that turns it into a story that says this happened because that happened uh, and if we don't have all those parts when we hear the information for the first time and so this is where it becomes really important for businesses if we don't hear all those parts a couple things can happen one is it, that story that we're, you know, this information doesn't make sense. And because there's plenty of other stories that do, we just ignore it. And so that can often be the reason why a business isn't getting traction in the marketplace with how they talk about their story. The second thing is if all those elements aren't necessarily there and they're not strung together in a way that, that coheres, people can walk away with a completely different story than you intended. Um, then that's also not good. Um, and then a third thing can happen, which is they may hear it and they may even understand it, but they aren't compelled to act. And so this was, you know, the, it was this swirl of problems that I, I wanted to see if I could help tackle. Um, and what I found over and over again is that when those five elements are present, that people have enough information to be compelled to act. And, and uh, that was pretty exciting to discover. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And obviously you put that all in your book, find your red red thread, make your big ideas ir irresistible so people can go read the book and get, get even more information. But I think one of the things I like there is, and I think this may be an issue sometimes, is what you outlined here is, it's very logical, It's it's, but we sometimes think, well, well, we're too sophisticated, right? Our messaging needs to be more sophisticated. So following a good story arc like this or whatever just seems like, well, that's that seems so kind of amateurish. We're, we're way more sophisticated than that. But the reality is that we're not. This is no, how no. we process. The business may be, but the, the brains of everybody that you're yeah. talking to is not. Like, I think that's that's what it comes down to is like, this is how we process new information, full stop. So you can either make the choice to make it easy on your audiences to understand what you're saying by giving them the elements of the stories that their brains are looking for anyway, or you can make it hard for them. Uh, and the you know so much cognitive behavior and neuroscience tells us that we humans do not do hard things <laughs> for long. Um, so the, you know, my approach, because I've always, you know, most of the time I've spent you know, working in and for organizations that have limited time and limited budgets. I want to make it as easy on my audience as possible to understand what I'm talking about, understand the impact for them, agree, right, that, that, that this is the right answer for them. And then most importantly, act, uh, because it's the acting piece that, that was always so fascinating to me about, well, even when we know the right answer, so often we don't act, even when we're mm -hmm. presented with what seems clearly, you know, from a logical standpoint, maybe a better solution. Why don't we adopt it? Um, and that's because we haven't found that emotional component uh, that isn't necessarily like tugging on people's heartstrings or invoking fear. But I find it's actually quite a different emotional component. It is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a conflict between what they want, what they believe, and what they've been doing so far. And that's not that that discomfort that comes from that. That's what is the that's what has to happen before someone will act. Yeah, I know that's that's fascinating, and I, I I totally agree. And that's why I think there is that disconnect sometimes between organization and indivi and and human beings. Um, <laughs> yes. for, for instance, uh, <laughs> that we don't we don't. Um, and here's the other interesting thing: is we walk through. So we walk through the door. Uh, maybe it's a virtual door of our organization. And suddenly we forget how we consume information ourselves. We forget yes. how what we like and we we deliver a completely different experience to to our to our prospects and customers. Yeah, I call it the persuaders paradox where we're willing to do to other people what would never fly when done to us or, you know, we're convinced that everybody will suddenly, yeah, I remember when Facebook first came out, I was working in a, an advertising agency at the time. Uh, and the, the clients would come in and be like, we need a Facebook page. 
And I, and I would ask them, I'm like, do you go to any company Facebook pages? And at the time they were like, no. And I'm like, well, why? <laughs> like then I know I'm the one that's supposed to sell them a Facebook page, but uh, you know, it was actually written on my business card that I was a resident skeptic of this, of these kinds of new things. And so um, it was, and people would always like, oh, that's true. I don't, I don't do that. And, oh, it's just true for so much that we do when we, from marketing and sales messaging, it's just, we just do things that we wouldn't tolerate. And yet we're somehow sure that other people will. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing, Tamsin, too, is that sometimes is that we, we get so enamored with these different platforms or new shiny new toys and all of that. And then we start adapting to the platform as opposed to figuring out our, our the core of our message to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, that and that was part of my my frustration and my challenge, you know, heading up marketing departments, working in agencies, helping folks with their campaigns and messages was that there is a point at which it becomes nigh on impossible to keep up with all the evolution in the channels and the platforms and all of that. And so again, limited time, limited budget. I said, you know, my approach was to say, what will work no matter the platform? And that's really where my love and discovery and deep dive into, well, how do people, how do people process information? How do people make these decisions? How do we, how do we get intrinsic motivation to happen? Uh, because this other stuff that we're doing is full stop, not working. So what would work better? Um, because if we can figure out what makes humans act, what, what information do they need in any piece of communication in order to change their thinking or behavior, then it, we get this point of comfort and power where it doesn't really matter what platform we're on, because now we know what, the kinds of things that we need to be putting out there and the kinds of information, the kinds of structures of communications in order to create those results that we're looking for. No, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that's the key rather than, you know, come, the, come backwards, as I said, work from the platform backwards is work from your, from your message forward. There's also something that you touched on there that I just wanted to come back to, and that's about the emotional connection. And mm. as you said, I mean, sometimes when you say like, oh, you know, get an emotional connection with the other person, as you said, people start to think, oh, it's something big and dramatic. And well, it's normally not. Um, but I do think that because of the pandemic and I think even before the pandemic, I think people were starting to want to have a little bit more human connection or interaction mm. with people, authenticity, trust, those kinds of things. I think they've they that got uh, obviously accentuated during the, the pandemic, and now I think we're we're at a point where you have to be able to humanize to some degree. Yes, uh, yes, and that's part. That's one of the things that I I feel most proud of with the Red Thread, which is that it's anchored in it's anchored in understanding what your audience wants and what your audience believes and what your audience is likely to accept. Um, and you can't do that work without acknowledging, understanding, and in many ways, validating the humanity. And it was, as I like to put it, the, the smart, capable goodness uh, of the people that you're talking to. And when, you know, I, you know, I get asked the question a lot, like, what's the big mistake that we make in our messages? And I, you know, there's plenty. <laughs> but, but one of them is that a lot of times when we put our messages out there, we are writing them from the perspective of somebody who's already convinced that they're right, that our ideas are correct, and that we're already convinced that our ideas are the best one, which means we completely miss some of the big questions, the big objections, the big concerns that people have about our product services and ideas. So that's where the whole big idea of the book comes in, where it's we're building the story that people would tell themselves. They're going to do it anyway. So why don't we supply the story that's stronger than the one that they're telling themselves now? But to do that, again, it has to be one that they would be comfortable telling or else they won't do it, full stop. And like I said, you just can't do that work without taking a moment to stop and understand what your idea looks like from the outside, from the position of a skeptic, from the position of someone who isn't convinced that it's right. And I think that that gives all of us a better understanding of the gray <laughs> that exists in between. Um, and I think just a better understanding of the people that we're talking to and sometimes even our own organizations and ideas. Yeah, because I mean, I think sometimes 
because you get so hung up on our own idea uh, that when you ha have the conversation and that natural skepticism raises uh, raises itself, we then get d defensive and think now we have to defend our position mm. as opposed to understand where the skepticism is coming from. Exactly. And defending a position is never a good place to start because what does that immediately set up in the other person that also sets yeah. up defense? Um, but it, it's counterintuitive. And to some extent, we have to work against our own wiring when someone's like, oh, I don't agree. But that's why, you know, that's, you know, that's why the, I take the approach that I do with my clients and in the book is to say, well, if you can find the issues with your idea first, <laughs> then you're going to be much more comfortable, you know, answering any questions that come from them. And to be able to think about your idea from that position of, you know, what, what would a cynic or a skeptic think of it? How, why, you know, under what circumstances would that person actually go, you know what, that does make sense. Uh, that is that you're right. That's better. That, that is a better, you know, whether they do it consciously or not, they're saying to themselves, that's a, that's a better story. That one's more likely to end in the happy ending that I'm looking for than whatever it is I'm doing now. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating there what you said as well, because um, I think that it's it's difficult, as you said, counterintuitive, it's difficult sometimes for people to to pick holes in their own story, to to look at, OK, why might somebody be skeptical about my product? Because you, your product or service, because you might just, you know, you've, you've poured your heart and soul into it. It's your baby. It's yeah. and now you're actually sort of standing over the crib and going, hmm. Maybe it's my baby is not as fantastic as yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. Do I have a troll baby? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I would, I, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes all of a sudden you realize, you know, in this work and sometimes that, that, that the idea isn't as, as, as you've been talking about it, isn't as strong as maybe you thought. But my experience over and over and over again is that a strong idea actually is always there. And, and almost always it's bigger and stronger than the one that you thought you had. Um, we just have to do some of that digging and kind of go back and reconstruct some of the things that our brain did in the dark. And like I said, so much of this processing and the story creation happens pre-consciously. Like we, we literally don't realize that we've we've done it, that we've found these shifts in perspectives and that we've rooted them in our core beliefs and we don't even know which one of those are. So it, it's so interesting to me sometimes when I'm working with clients, you know, that when we, when we excavate that, when we bring that out and say, well, how are you looking at it? Like, what, what did you notice when you were looking at the market um, that it seemed like nobody else was seeing? And the number of times that they just come up with these wonderful examples and this wonderful explanation that turns out to be one of the cornerstone cornerstones of a differentiated value prop. Um, it just happens every time. It just, it really does, but it, it is that process of excavation. And I think sometimes too, um, that we've almost been dissuaded from trusting our instincts in some mm. ways as well, because everything is, uh, everything has to be like, data driven and all of this kind of stuff which is great and i and i totally agree with that in some in some areas but i do think we have shit we have kind of pushed aside instinct and it's sometimes it's our instincts that come up with the greatest uh, breakthroughs yeah I, I i say this to my clients often you actually know your audience better than you think you do i mean there's a i mean i'm married to a market researcher so so there are plenty of times where people are like but do i know enough about our audience in order to be able to answer these questions and i'm like well yeah you can absolutely go and do this research ahead of time you can validate the work that we've done afterwards you know we've we've you know tom and i have worked together to, to do that um but to get get a place to start right you you actually do know your audience a little bit better than you think you do. Um, because there's, even if it's just from the perspective of, you know, who within that wide population of audience are the people that you really want to serve. Even if your client, your product, your service, your idea could serve everybody, there is actually a subset of those people who are really meant for you. Um, and that you want to help with. And it's, and it's funny, it doesn't take much pushing when I'm, you know, one-on-one -on -one with clients to, to start to reveal that. I said, well, you know, would somebody who 
believe this be a client, a good candidate for you? And they're like, no. I'm like, so you aren't for everybody, right? Like, because people who, let's say, don't value, um, you know, uh, I don't know, credibility, let's say, yeah. um, for whatever reason, you know, well, then they're not going to pay the premium price for your products. So those are not your people. And mm -hmm. maybe someday you could get them, but why waste that limited time and effort we've been talking about and money um, on people who are going to take that much work? <laughs> like, <laughs> let's let's just focus on the people who are already of a mindset to 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 be open to your idea, um, even if they don't know it yet. But you do, you the organization, you the founder, you the idea creator. Um, you actually do because you 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 created this idea to to answer a specific question uh, for people who believe and value certain things. And so, you know, I had this realization one time. It was funny. My, my husband and I were talking about it because it was in the context of somebody talking about their new podcast. I think it was Seth Rogen. You know, somebody asked him who his podcast was for, right. um, and he goes, "Everybody." And if you know Seth Rogen and what he believes in and all of that, like he's not for everybody, right? Yeah. So the, the the remark that I made to my husband at the time was, I think whenever we say that, we mean everybody who sees the world we the way that we do. Mm. And that's really what the process of the red thread is all about, is saying, well, how do I see the world so that I actually can have a better understanding of who I'm talking to? <laughs> uh, because I'm looking for people who who see the world a very similar way, even if it's not exactly the same way yet. Yeah, that's that's a great example. And thank you for that. I think that's a fantastic example, because often we are very tempted to think that everybody is our customer or that even a massive subset is is our customer uh, because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel yeah, like we have exactly. a bigger- Exactly, it's human, of course. Yeah, yeah, we have a much bigger addressable market, all of this. And when you when you specialize and when you start to really target, Maybe it's a little uncomfortable because then you go, oh, this is a little smaller than I expected. But in reality, this may be where you generate the uh, where you generate where you would have generated 80 percent of your revenue. The anyway. effort is less. And yeah, Th that's that's the key is that the effort will be less. Um, I, I believe that most of the laws of physics can be applied to anything. And so in my mind, you know, I. I, I think of this in terms of the conservation of energy law, right? Where the, no energy is lost. In other words, there's always an equal amount of work. It's just, where is it going to happen? So sure, you could try to you know, blanket the world and with your message, and you're going to touch a lot of people, but a very small percentage of those people are going to convert. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of work. Another kind of work is to address a much, much smaller market that's much, much more likely to convert. At the end of the day, it may be a similar amount of effort. I think you're going to convert more people when you're converting a you know a larger number, even if it's of a, of a smaller, smaller population mm -hmm. to start. Um, and like I said, I'm all in for the most efficient use of the the resources that we have uh, and the time that we have. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, listen, Tamsin, this has been fantastic. All of Tamsin's information is going to be below this video, um, links to the website, to the book, Find Your Red Thread, Make Your Big Ideas Irresistible. And as you've heard from, from this interview, I would highly, highly recommend you to, to check it out. Uh, and uh, But before we go, Tamsin, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and the work you do. Sure. Well, I, as you said before, I, you know, I'm a message strategist. I like to say that my main role is as an English to English translator, uh, translating the language of the expert of you who knows your idea inside and out to the language of the everyday so that anybody can understand it. Um, yeah, I do that work in a number of ways, lots of one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting work, but I also speak and uh, do workshops and other occasional masterminds. Yeah, this has been fantastic. Well, being Irish, I have to translate myself. Yeah. Oh, and I have an Irish, <laughs> I have an Irish retired racing greyhound who like oh, named Walnut. Do. Yes, oh, he was, he was from Limerick. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, I guess um, I, I have to be careful what I say now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make a comment about Limerick, but then like, you know. The, yeah, but that, yes. But there you I go. don't know if that extends to the, the nature of the dog as well. Like, <laughs> technically well, from Kilmeady, but yes. Yeah, well, maybe that's why he moved. I don't know. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> and I apologize. 
I, uh, give, give, I apologize give a deeply. Here in Boston. <laughs> yeah, I apologize deeply to all of my friends from Limerick. <laughs> all right, well, listen, Tamsin, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care.